Okay, so what I want to do here now is to start a new series on um, Arnold Toynbee's A Study of History. I want to do the unabridged version, which is ten volumes long, uh, which I've never read. Um, only uh, the Somerville uh, two-volume abridgment, which is very good and which Toynbee liked and approved of. Uh, it's extremely readable. I recommend going through that. Um, then, uh, at the end of his career in the 1970s, he wrote his own abridgment, which is a large illustrated edition, but it's done entirely by him. Uh, and it's really a different book. I, he completely rewrites it. Now, these ten volumes were not published all at once. Uh, Toynbee is, of course, a British historian coming out of the British academic world. So he's totally the opposite from Spengler's world. Spengler uh, was a high school teacher who has chewed uh, academe, even though he did get his Ph.D., he did it on a dissertation on Heraclitus, but then it's interesting that he decided to not go into the academic world and just go teach the kids. He obviously didn't like uh, his peers or any kind of intellectual competition. He was a total autodidact. And um, so Spangler was a nomad, basically, whereas Toynbee is in the system. He is front row, center, mainstream. Uh, he taught at King's College uh, most of his life. Um, so, writes in an academic style. It's kind of dry. By comparison with Spengler, it's totally dry, and I think it's one of the reasons that put people off from reading him, because it sort of reads a bit like a textbook, except it's not. You just have to get the rhythm. Uh, if you read Toynbee, and I, here in this video series, I'm not going to actually, like I was doing with Spengler, read him line by line, or we'll, we'll never get through it. Uh, I'm going to do like what I did with my original Spengler series and go through and synopsize each chapter for you. Um, and I think it'll be uh, very interesting to compare these two equally brilliant thinkers. Um, so the first three volumes came out in 1933. They came out in batches, uh, or 34, actually. Um, the introduction, which I'm still waiting for my hard copy of it in the mail. I've had to use the Internet Archive uh, version of it for this. Uh, but I do have volumes two uh, and three here. Uh, volume two is... The Genesis of Civilizations, and Volume 3 is on the Growths of Civilizations. Then the next three volumes come out in 1939, and then the last four volumes then uh, come out in 1954. So this is a 20-year magnum opus. I mean, he was writing other books in, in between, but uh, this guy was busy. He was a very busy man. Um, so it's huge. It's, it's enormous. It's, now, so we should go over briefly first his model Remember that Spengler had a four-phase model, uh, pre-culture, early culture, late culture, then civilization. Uh, civilization is the stiffening, dying phase where the life is just going out of the... And you can feel the civilization dying, the, the life soul actually, just, just like a body dying. Uh, and so uh, with Toynbee, we've got seven, uh, the magical number of seven, uh, which I'm always a little suspicious of because seven is a magical number. It's an important numerological number. It has a long mystical history. Rudolf Steiner divides everything into sevens, which I find a little bit hard to believe that the cosmos and nature poured itself out neatly always into seven phases. To me, it sounds a little like the projection of a Kantian architectonic on the material just to get a grasp on it. But you do have to have some kind of uh, conceptual apparatus to organize the material so it's not just a mess. So it's fine. Seven stages are fine. Um, so he's got the first stage of civilizations are, of course, the uh, creations of civilization, the genesis, uh, and it's interesting that he calls it the genesis of civilizations, echoing the biblical world of the book of Genesis. Um, Tony is very artistic, even though he's coming out of a somewhat specialized world of the historian's uh, professor worldview. Nonetheless, he is very well-rounded and very poetic uh, as he goes through. He makes lots of Wonderful poetic analogies, very colorful thinker. I wouldn't read him if he was totally as dry as everyone thinks that he is. He's not. Uh, he's very, very imaginative, almost as e equally so as Spengler. Just not, the mysticism isn't there. This isn't a mystical guy, uh, but he is a humanities guy. Um, okay, so the genesis, then the growths of civilizations, and that's what these first three volumes cover. And then after that we get their breakdowns, uh, breakdowns, of civilizations and the decay of civilizations stages uh, so one two three four and then finally we get the creation of a universal state 
the creation of a universal church, and then uh, the heroic ages, or the barbarian ages. And his books sort of follow that model pr pretty neatly, pretty squarely right down the line, going through those seven stages. Um, so keep that in mind as the trajectory, as the target here, as we go through the first volume, which is something called Introduction. Uh, and let's see, glancing at it here, in my electronic version of it. Um, so the first volume then, it's written like a work of philosophy. The way that he arranges it uh, is very much the way you would arrange a work of philosophy. Reminds me a bit of Kant. Um, he has it divided into uh, three parts, A, B, and C. The first part, A, is on the relativity of historical thought, which is basically the introductory essay, which we're going to talk about here. B is the field of historical study. Um, C is the comparative study of, of civilizations. Now, that's going to be a very important idea here. His main idea is to introduce a comparative study of civilizations. Nietzsche somewhere says in his notebooks, we are moving into an age now of comparisons, uh, like the Hellenistic world of the Greeks, where all the civilizations are now interacting in such a way that uh, it's no longer parochial, it's cosmopolitan, and the outlook becomes more and more uh, universal. And other histories, other souls of other cultures have to be dealt with and taken into account. Um, so Toynbee wants to introduce this idea of the comparative study of civilizations, and he calls them societies. Spangler calls them cultures, of which he says there are nine. Toynbee calls them societies, and he'll have about 20 or so of them, 21. The number changes uh, at the end of his career, the, the number fluctuates. Uh, and one of my criticisms was, like I mentioned in the Spangler videos, is that uh, Toynbee tends to parse where he should not. For example, the Babylonic society is not separate from the Mesopotamian society. That's the same civilization, the Sumero, the Mesopotamian civilization, the Sumero, Akkadian, Babylonian civilization. That's one civilization there. Uh, it breaks up India into an early uh, India, the Indic India versus the Hindu India. It does the same thing with China. These are not different civilizations. They're the same civilizations going through different phases. But anyhow, um, so then these phases, or, or these uh, chapters rather, A, B, and C are then subdivided. A is not. A is just the introduction. B is subdivided into uh, five subsections. The field of historical study, the test case of Great Britain, the field of which Great Britain is a part, the extension of our field in space, the extension of our field in time, and some provisional conclusions. Uh, we'll see why this chapter is so important in a minute here. Then the comparative study of civilizations, um, uh, is subdivided into three sections also. Uh, one is a survey of societies of the species. Two is a provisional classification of societies of the species. Three is the comparability of societies of the species. Note his use of the word species. Um, he criticizes Spengler. Uh, he's read and metabolized Spengler, of course, and I think Spengler had a lot to, to do with inspiring him to, to write this. Um, but he criticizes Spengler's biologism and the application of too much uh, biological, too many biological metaphors to these societies. But as you're reading through Toynbee, uh, he pretty much does the same thing. Species. He calls these, these are different species of societies, uh, and they have a growth, uh, a, a genesis, a birth, a growth, a break. I mean, the model is very biological and organic, almost as much as Spengler's is. It's just not deterministic, like the life cycle, the life cycle of an organism is. A human life cycle isn't going to go over a hundred years. Uh, that's it. That's the limit of its morphological span, so in a way, it's predetermined. Um, so Spengler's model comes out of that predetermination, whereas Toynbee's model is not predetermined. It's sort of, things happen as they go along, but it does end up with seven distinct phases, so it may as well be a deterministic model anyway. Uh, so I think it's kind of funny, uh, Toynbee's criticisms do boomerang quite a bit uh, of Spengler back on him as well. So he will look at a number of examples in this uh, comparative study chapter of individual societies, the Orthodox Christian Society, the Iranic and Arabic Societies, the Syriac Society. The Syriac Society is his name for the Magian culture, but then he sees, of course, the Iranic uh, or Achaemenid uh, Empire and the Arabic as offshoots, uh, or in a way as uh, aff affiliated to it in some way. We'll, we'll see how that works. The Indic Society the Sinic Society, Fossils, the Minoan Society, the Sumeric Society, the Hittite Society, the Babylonic Society, mistake there, 
The Babylonic society is not separate from the Sumeric and have a hard time considering the Hittites as their own unique civilization. They're kind of copycats. They represent, and I think he changes this later on, and introduces the concept of a satellite society. The Hittites are a satellite society. They are totally different people. They're Indo-Aryans to the Sumero mesopotamian world, the Mesopotamian world, but all their culture forms are Mesopotamian. All their gods are Mesopotamian, except for some Indo-Aryan uh, goddesses and gods that have been introduced and syncretistically pulled together by the Hittites. I don't see them as a society or a civilization into themselves. Um, the Andean society, the Yucatec Mexican Mayan societies, and then the Egyptiac society. So he'll go through and talk about each one of these in this introductory volume. Um, and then second, then a provisional classification of societies. And third, the comparability of societies of the species, uh, which is A, B, C, D, and E. A is the distinction between civilizations and primitive societies. Why those two have to be regarded as two totally different types of societies, different species, as he'll say, using his biological metaphor. Uh, B is the misconception of the unity of civilization. Um, C is the philosophical contemporaneity of all representatives of the species. D is the philosophical equivalence of all representatives of the species. And E is the comparability of the facts encountered in the study of civilization. So we're going to go through this chapter by chapter. And today we'll talk about the first chapter, which is the relativity of historical thought. Here, uh, let me flip over to it. Now what he does here... Um, as he says that first there have been two great dominant tendencies um, that have guided civilization in our time, as he's writing this in 1933 or thereabouts. Um, and those are, on the one hand, industrialization, which is on the economic plane, which is different from where we're at on the political plane. The political plane, the driving force is now democracy, so that's the political plane. So we have these two forces uh, that are operating and, and interoperating, but they'll end up doing different things. Um, as we go along, as we'll see. So we have these two primary forces, he says, that we have to contend with. And, and now he takes his critique. Uh, the, the upshot of this chapter is aimed at mechanization. It's aimed at the industrial mentality. Basically, um, he is a British equivalent of, of Spangler in almost every sense, because basically his criticism here of what he calls industrialization and its misapplication to the field of historical studies uh, it's basically the same thing as Spengler's distinction between the causality principle and the destiny idea. The systematic man, the machine man, the man who thinks mechanically, and the physiognomist like Goethe who thinks artistically. Uh, Toynbee is doing basically the same thing here as he attacks this idea. What he says is that industrialization has invaded our society to such an extent now that it's invaded the sphere of the humanities where it doesn't belong, especially his field, history. He says, uh, he gives a little anecdote where he says, when I was a kid, I remember, I used to go over to this scientist guy's house, uh, and I remember going to it all through the years as I was growing up, off and on, and looking at initially the volumes on his shelves uh, in his library were all these huge uh, books, a lot of universal histories, big volumes of literature and studies of uh, large uh, sort of macrospheric fields of study. And he says, over time I noticed that his library began to in be invaded by these scientific treatises that began to insert themselves randomly, these offshoots of papers and seminars that are based on specializations of various scientists, uh, and there would be volumes of collected lectures, uh, none of which were connected to each other, uh, that would slowly invade and push out the general humanistic volumes that were on these shelves. And he says, that made me feel really uncomfortable because I thought these later books were you know, snarky, specialized, and they, they lost the big picture. And he says that historians now, even in his time, historians were against the big picture approach that writers like he and Spengler were doing. He said H.G. Uh, Wells's outline of history, for instance, when it came out, uh, was an attempt to write a universal vision of history. Uh, which was very popular, I think it was a bestseller, like Decline of the West, very popular with the crowd, but of course the historians hated it, uh, and he said they all looked at it with a specialized point of view, how dare you try to write an entire history of the human race, we don't do that now, we, what's your special field, you, know, you have to be a specialist, and this is, I'm totally with Toynbee here, I mean, this is why I left the fucking world of academe behind, those snarky little fucks, 
uh, who want you to specialize. And they're so arrogant about it, these little monkeys hanging on their branches of specialization, defending their little territorial branches on their banana trees, throwing bananas at each other. It's totally ridiculous, and that's why I left the world of academe to go out and become a nomad. Uh, to do what I'm doing here is to try to restore big picture views of history. Um, I am well aware of the postmodern critiques of these things as a form of intellectual colonialism, but that's total nonsense. That needs to go away. We're done with that kind of thinking here. Back to the big picture. We're looking for new cosmologies in the age of hypermodernity that we are in now. Uh, in order to do that, we need to go back and look at earlier big picture uh, creations by people like Toynbee and Spengler to see how they did it. Uh, what of those visions can be left behind as Drek, and what can be kept uh, and used as inspirational models, perhaps, for new cosmologies. We are in the age of the emergence of great new religions, great new cosmologies. They are coming into being. On Spengler's morphology, we are right at the period of the second religiousness. Okay, so, uh, which creates all these new religions, a great Hellenistic age, Ro or Roman imperial age, rather. And so, uh, time goes along, and he's critiquing this misapplication of the industrial method to the sciences, and he says, take as an example uh, the ridiculous fact that um, if we look at what happened after Alexander uh, and his world collapsed and broke off into two separate what he calls great powers, the Seleucids uh, in Asia Minor uh, primarily, and the Ptolemies, uh, both are Greek interfusions. Uh, one is the northern one is a Hellenic interfusion with what he calls the Syriac Society, which is basically his word for the Magian, the Middle Eastern Society, their fusion, which he says was incredibly fruitful, in contrast to the Greek fusion with the Egyptiac Society, with the Ptolemies, which he says wasn't particularly fruitful, really, and is nowhere near as interesting as what went on with the Seleucids in the Middle East. Um, with the Egyptians, we just basically got the introduction of the Isis cults into the Roman Empire. Uh, Time is like big deal, but the fact of the matter is, what has survived due to the different climates? The north is very rainy, wet, snow, all kinds of dampness. Upper Egypt, which is the further south uh, part of Egypt, um, has preserved so many uh, papyri, papyri, uh, papyrus scrolls and manuscripts uh, that it's just a huge historian's field day. And so the historian, whereas the Seleucids, all we have is a bunch of coins. Uh, there's not a lot of concrete material there, but the Seleucid world, he says, is way more interesting by far, uh, and way more historical research needs to be done on it. It, after all, ended up producing Christian great syncretistic religions like Christianity, um, eventually Islam, in between there, bizarre mutant religions like Monarchianism and Mith Mithraism. All of that came out of the marriage of the Hellenic with the Syriac society in that Greek ecumeny there, and, of course, these two great powers were always fighting over possession of the Middle East. So they were also interacting as well. But he says Egypt, the Upper Egypt under the Ptolemies just isn't that interesting. But the historians choose that field because they've got a wealth of stuff that needs to be translated, needs to be worked on. And he says, so we know all this stuff about administration and politics and uh, who was ruling where, what, who was shopping, uh, whatever f fucking equivalent of Walmart it was. You know, it's boring stuff. He's, the, you know, this, the, the historian should work on the Seleucid problem. So he says this is another problem in the field of history where people migrate into areas of specialization where there's more raw material for them to mine. Uh, okay, so he talks about that, and then he talks about, so there's another problem with historians today, and it has to do with the problem of nationalism. In addition to uh, democracy, on the one hand, on the economics plane, and industrialization on the, um, on the economic plane and democracy on the political plane, uh, we have to take into account the invasion of nationalism, uh, especially since uh, uh, 1875, moving into the fields of historical studies such that we now have this problem where a French historian will write, he gives an example of some obscure guy, writing a history uh, of France, our origins, but he writes the whole, the, the whole book is basically just, it's parochial, it's the, everything's about France. Uh, the French historian tends to write about history in terms of the French gaze. Uh, he'll go digging back into the Neolithic and even find, oh, there are these little Frenchisms in the Neolithic that eventually lead to us. Um, British historians are going to write histories of Britain. Um, so he said, we have a problem here 
where nationalism has invaded these fields and caused this very parochial view of trying to write the history of the West uh, in terms of one or the other of these nation states. And he says, imagine if we tried to do this, uh, we tried to make like Holland uh, or Sweden uh, the center uh, of a history of the West. You, you can't do it. There's, so he says there's a certain amount of legitimacy to it because of the incredible, important historical role played by France uh, in the West. Um, you know, I suppose you could, do the, you could say that the four greatest national powers in the West are, of course, Spain, uh, France, Germany, and England. Everyone else is scattered uh, droplets in between them, but there's no way you could take uh, Holland or Sweden or Switzerland or Norway or Portugal and try to write the history of the West through them. It just, it just won't work. France, you can do it uh, to a limited extent. He's, she's drawing a boundary here. There is, after all, a boundary between uh, the South, the world of what was called Gaul, uh, the South, and the North, uh, the world of the Saxons. Uh, under Charlemagne, there's... You know, the Germans and the French have been fighting forever. Um, so there's a certain degree of legitimacy to them wanting to take priority and say, well, the history of Europe is really about the history of France. No, the history of Europe is really about the history of Germany um, because they've been fighting all along under Charlemagne. Uh, you have the Franks in the south, and Charlemagne orders them to go and massacre the Saxons in the north to force them to convert to Christianity, which they don't want to do. Uh, the Germans were the last to convert to Christianity all the way down to 1000 A.D. Uh, the Scandinavians were the last to convert uh, they really held on, because these are two different cultures here, uh, or not, maybe not necessarily cultures, but they are two different kinds of nationalities that have been in contention for a very long period of time, with the Rhine as a kind of boundary going all the way back to the Battle of the Tudorberg Forest, where Arminius fought with uh, the Roman legions who tried to come in there, and the Germans, led by Arminius, uh, just wiped them out. I mean, the, the Romans were horrified, and that set a boundary line as the Rhine, as the boundary between the North and the South, these are two different societies, two different mentalities, two different ways of thinking. Later, Toynbee will say that Europe is made up of these two in a kind of suture of the um, Promethean North. Uh, the North is always forward-looking. There's a reason why all the great scientists came out of the North, writing came out of the North. The South is Epimethean, the brother of Prometheus who looks back. It's always stuck looking back to its Mediterranean past, whereby once it was the Roman Empire that was, you know, had covered Gaul. And it's a huge part of it's being connected to the history of the Eastern Mediterranean and therefore the Middle East as well. So it's kind of sucked it into an, um, a kind of Mediterranean pseudomorphosis that the North has been free of. The North has always been like, we're doing our own thing up here. Uh, so he's got a very good point here about this parochialism that historians, when they sit down to write and tell the story of the West, are still fighting these world wars, this tribalism mentality. And he's like, surely there is a larger field of historical study here uh, than just France, a, a history of Europe through the eyes of a Frenchman, or the history of Europe through the eyes of a German. And in a way, this is comparable to Spengler attacking the Ptolemaic model. Uh, Spengler's primary target is the Ptolemaic model of history, whereby he says that the problem we get stuck with uh, is this ridiculous, worn-out, ancient, medieval, modern scheme uh, it's crap, and it's Ptolemaic because everything centers around the West and the other civilizations are just scattered satellites, whereas his Copernican model was based on seeing the West as equally a part of its own world history, as China has its own, India has its own. Uh, there are all these monstrosities with their own, with, where history occurs within them uniquely, and the West is no different from the rest of these and does not belong in, in a privileged position in any way, shape, or form. And so, time be... Toynbee's critique here that's equivalent to that is his critique of parochialism. This is, is first the critique of industrialism, and it's spread into the humanities, especially into the world of historical studies, which he finds offensive. Um, most of his metaphors are drawn from, uh, a lot of them from biology, but also from literature and the arts and the humanities. Uh, and then second, uh, the, the attack against parochialism. And then the chapter ends with him asking then two questions. Okay, so what is the field, the intelligible field of study that we should be looking at, and two, is there such a universal field that is absolute and makes relative the points of views of all of these different parochial peoples and nations? Um, so what he's going to say then is, in the next chapter, he will move into Great Britain as a test case. Let's try to look back step by step, starting with the most recent uh, history of Britain, and we'll go back step by step, 
And the further back he goes, you'll see the more British history becomes entwined with the continent, so that it becomes impossible after a certain point uh, to write a history of Britain without also writing about the entire continent. This is one society here he's going to end up saying, and he'll push the boundary back and look for where the edge is, and he'll find it with Charlemagne. Ah, Charlemagne and his creation of his empire uh, is where the West basically begins. Uh, that is the intelligible field of historical study, uh, which is absolute and universal, and you'll find that each one of these civilizations has their own intelligible field of historical study, uh, and this is his equivalent to the Spenglerian souls uh, that animate the, the Ur ideas, the Ur Zambala that animate each of these civilizations. This is his equivalent. So this is what Spengler would call Faustian civilization, as he goes back and he looks at the history of the West back to Charlemagne. This is our field of historical study for this particular uh, example of the species of uh, higher, the higher societies known as civilizations. Um, okay, so that brings us up to date. That's the introduction, uh, the synopsis of the introduction to a study of history. So next we'll move on into uh, the next chapter.